A very good day to you, ladies and gentlemen, um, in front of the screens. My name is Hannes Schramm. I'm the cultural property protection expert in the Office of Cultural Affairs in the Principality of Liechtenstein. Um, today, I have the pleasure to introduce you to a very important topic when it comes to extraordinary events or more specific to emergencies. Um, as I chose the expression extraordinary, I wanted to express uh, the circumstance that they do not happen very often. But um, yeah, normally, statistically, in over 95% of all cases, we are allowed to live our lives in, as usual and follow our daily routine, like every day. Nevertheless, uh, as soon as it comes to such an event, it happens suddenly with no or nearly uh, or very little advance warning time and with unpredicted, enormous fundamental changes and disastrous consequence. The only way to cope with such situations adequately is to find ways to foresee and to predict them, to prepare for such situations, and to have processes in place to react on such um, events and incidents efficiently and effectively. So that's why I'm going to talk to you uh, today about managing complex emergencies. So we are following today the, uh, uh, this agenda, meaning at the beginning we will have a look at an emergency management model we use, for example, in Liechtenstein uh, in the cultural property protection system. Then we see what cultural, uh, what emergency management systems are, uh, why they are necessary, and what they contain. Emergency management structures, why we need them, <clears throat> what structures mean. Um, what a decision-making process is um, and um, with what it helps us. And in the end, I want to stress the importance of um, the preparation and training. I don't know. Um, starting with emergency management systems. Sorry, with, emergency man uh, with the emergency management model. Um, If you have a look on that, um, you can see different phases. Um, we have that, by the way, um, introduced this year in March, or last year, 2023 in March, in, with our uh, cultural property protection guideline in the Principality of Liechtenstein, which is available via our homepage. Um, it stresses three different phases. First of all, in this, uh, uh, we, have to, um, we have to see that here. It's about damage prevention. Um, this happens in, in the normal condition, in the normal phase, in normal life. Um, best of all would be when we conduct a risk management in this time, where we combine the, the probability uh, of the occurrence of, of an event, of an incident, uh, with the maximum damage this incident can cause. Uh, and therefore find solution, how we reduce them, minimize them, and uh, or how we can cope with them. Because when the event starts here, it comes suddenly. And then, first of all, we have a chaos phase, meaning nobody knows what to do or what is much more dangerous. Everybody knows what to do in his own way, uh, meaning there is no coordination, there's, uh, there's panic, there's... Um, focus on himself, herself, and um, not on the situation itself. Um, so the aim is to go through, uh, uh, go out of this um, um, chaos phase as fast as possible to manage this, uh, uh, the event phase itself. In this event phase, it's about damage minimization and damage reduction by intervention. Intervention of first respond, uh, first res emergency first responders, uh, or for example, in our case now, um, a, uh, a cultural property protection assets we um, trained before and uh, uh, which we, we have in, in place for such a reason. So um, what do we do here? We set measures. We set measures like protection measures, safety and uh, safeguarding measures, security measures, and stabilization measures. We, what we have to have in mind is this phase is then over as soon as we are 
free in our minds and free with time and free with decision to um to to decide how to go on with um the situation as long as the situation uh forces us to do decisions and to to react on the situation it's this event phase if this is over and we are free to decide what to do next what to uh, uh how we how we handle the damage how we going to handle the damage it this recovery phase starts here yes in the recovery phase it's all about damage management about the recuperation uh, recuperation meaning going back to uh, the status quo or the status uh, we had before but uh, um being aware of that we are not able to reach that status anymore uh but similar similar status more or less via restore, uh, um measures of restoration and reconstruction after that one has finished we enter again the normal phase so you see it here as a linear process but all in all is also a circular process meaning the normal condition the normal business brings us again to such a risk management uh, process we have to conduct to be able to react on the event maybe occurring event again in the future um to be able to run such a process it's clear that we need some kind of system a system which allows us to run it adequately, to run it in an appropriate way and in a regular, uh, regular uh, and rational way. Um, for that, we have emergency management system, management systems, or management systems uh, themselves uh, itself. <clears throat> they are the basis for the completion of tasks and issues. Um, they ensure higher leadership performances and high quality decisions. Um, they give us the ability to react and adapt on changing situations um, in, a, in a proper way. Uh, they ensure the survival and the endurance of personal material, that's clear, and they can guarantee interoperability. Uh, you have to imagine many situations are not able to be solved just by ourselves. Maybe we need help, maybe we need the support of other nations, other units, whatever. And so we need to be interoper interoperability, uh, interoperable. That means our system has to be uh, adoptable and um, 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 cooperative with our systems too. Reading through these bullet points, it seems logical to have such a system implemented, but how many institu institutions do you know who follow such a system um, in, a, in a voluntary way? A bit, also in a way that they have in, introduced it and really uh, stress it. Um, and the next question, what I want to bring to you is, what does that mean? It's clear when we have uh, such a system, it's good to, to achieve all these, these points here, but what does it mean? What does it contain? What is in it? Um, for that, I borrowed the system of the Austrian forces, which design, uh, defines itself in four pillars, um, uh, which includes all necessary factors to be able to withstand and persist in um, emergency situations. So these four pillars are um, the management organization, uh, which combines uh, or contains functions, meaning who is in charge, who is responsible for what, who supports whom, Basic material like guidelines, like info material, like um, 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 fo uh, like like um, duty roads, and so on, which are important. <clears throat> uh, also, like uh, processes and, and uh, etc. Then um, communication information systems, which ensure the information management and information flow uh, flow and um, structures structure, uh, which tells us. With whom do we have to work together? In which way? Who is responsible for what? Uh, who is um, the one who gives tasks and who is the one who receives tasks? Then the next th things are management instru uh, instruments like reporting systems, supervision systems, simulation systems, etc., um, which um, which cont which are contained here. I would I'm not going to stress that one uh, because that goes too deep. The principles, principles are very important as they define how we work and what our priorities are. They should be found 
through the whole emergency management process system, uh, management system, and also the process. And they are the basis uh, for our own action and also the values for our own action. And the fourth pillar um, that we can see here uh, is the decision-making process. One of the, the most important pillars of that all because this process guarantees us the production of decisions. So I'm going now to describe a little bit more structures and after the decision-making process. Emergency management structures, what are they? Why do we need them? We need them to uh, for the determination of responsibilities and, uh, uh, and tasks. It's for regulation of management, uh, management processes. It ensures the interaction of available elements. It ensures the solving yeah, of, um, uh, the interaction of available elements. Here, you have to mention if you are in charge of a big situation, you have many players which you have to coordinate. And uh, it makes sense that there is more or less a tool to, to, to do that and a structure which uh, guarantees an efficient and effective cooperation during, uh, uh, between these, um, these organizations and also a coordination between these uh, um, elements. It's, so in this way, it ensures the solving of, comp uh, uh, solving of complex, complex, sorry for that, complex problems. It enables the use of standardized techniques and procedures um, and guarantees via that a sustainable operability. Because if you have standardized techniques and procedures, everybody is educated uh, in, in the system is educated after them. So everybody is able to support each other or to replace each other if, uh, if necessary. Um, and for that, it also enables long-term management. Um, why that? Because such structures, stru structures should be built to last permanently. Here you have um, the example of the cultural property protection management structure in Liechtenstein, which is built on the one hand side downwards, meaning beginning, starting with the international and national requirements we have here, uh, with our laws and also the Hague Convention takes them into, uh, t into account, and it also takes in, into account um, the requirement of the object, uh, cultural, of the cultural asset itself that is affected by an incident. What does it need? There is a planning which is necessary, a depot which is necessary to bring in an uh, 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 object, responsible for the object, and so on. So <clears throat> this system takes all necessary actors here, like the uh, cultural property um, owners or the cultural institutions uh, or the minister, uh, ministries or um, the communities uh, into account and describes their role as well as their relation to each other and also defines the responsibilities. I'm not going to get closer in that. I just what, uh, want to show you here. Um, how that looks like, for example, um, uh, with our um, with our cultural property protection network, who supports whom, who does whom. On the first view, it's quite seems complicated, but all in all, um, you will you will a little bit later uh, identify a system about that. Here's an example of a standardized uh, battalion staff, how they work um, in an event, um, a battalion, military battalion staff. So um, you have here three areas three cells. Um, the one is the operation cell. Um, it's not so important to, to remember then the S functions, but I want to go through them nevertheless. So the S2 for military security, conflicting party situation. S3 for training of troops, execution of operation, the PR officer who is responsible for info, information operation. S4 who is responsible for logistics. The S1 who is responsible for um, um, personal uh, matches for prison of four disciplinary matches and the S6 who is responsible for TS systems. And they are, um, departed more or less in three responsibility areas. Here, the operations area, which is responsible for, um, for running the operation itself. The, uh, here, combat tourism supply, uh, area, which is, um, um, responsible for supporting the operation and, uh, provides everything 
what is needed for uh, bringing through the operation and for fulfilling the tasks. And here, all in all, also the co uh, the command, um, uh, the, the the communication information system cell, which is responsible for, as I already told you, uh, information management and information flow. Um, this is not always be seen. For example, um, yep, I will show you an example afterwards. But another point is what I want to stress that you always need one hat, a a an element which coordinates these two or three cells. In this case, a commander or the chief of staff. <clears throat> you can also see the principle when you see now uh, how our um, um, cultural property first response unit um, or first and fastest response unit uh, ha should work. Um, so this recruits itself out of our uh, cultural property protection network. Um, and has, it has here a commanding cell. It has a rapid uh, engagement or rapid uh, a rapid engagement cell. And it's a, log a logistic cell, which also cares about administration and uh, material in the depot and preparation of the depots and so on. And also one element, uh, which the, which means the enhancement and enforcement, uh, which recruits itself again via, via the, uh, the cultural property protection network. Um, but what the, um, the point on what, uh, I wanted to stress is here you also can see the operations part, the logistics part, which is responsible to support uh, the operations part and the commanding part, which coordinates um, the uh, um, the action and also um, finds out what additional uh, additional is needed to request enforcement. What brings me then to the management of different events because to go uh, to an event place and to, to do something, the most important part is to have uh, a decision how to react. So another very important part of the management system is a process that brings you, your staff, or your whole unit, or your, your whole company to a decision. There are different names for it, but as it is about decision-making, let's call it decision-making process. Such a process is a standardized process in which decisions are made, in which taking certain uh, certain principles uh, into account uh, are taken into account, and based uh, and based on the assessment of all available information, this one is conducted. It also includes the structured implementation of such decisions as orders, their distribution, their execution, and control in order to be able to react. To developments of the situation. All right. So, all in all, it is uh, a circular process that allows to adapt to situations. Maybe you think using decisions is easy. In front of a traffic light, when you see red, it's to stop. If you see green, if it's, it's a go. Sometimes emergency situations seem also very easy, and to take a decision seem to be easy, but believe me, it's not, because every decision you take has an effect on the ground, which um, you sometimes don't expect. So why do we do the decision-making processes? Why do we take our time for doing decision-making processes? Um, a DMP is comprehensive, so it's not just based on gut feeling. It's transparent. So if we have the process, uh, everybody else is to follow our decision and the way we came to our decision. And if it, something goes wrong, because if something goes wrong, it's every, uh, it's always like that, that everyone would have done it differently in another way. So it's always good to have more or less, um, um, a, a, um, an equilog more or less, uh, from the decision to see okay, how it was, t uh, taken. Decisions trigger decision making processes at every subordinate management level. The desired effect from my decision making process will that's why it will take some time to occur, uh, occur on the ground. And we have to have that in mind, that if we take a decision, if we distribute a task to our subordinate unit, it will take some time until it will be conducted. Um, that we also have in mind when we do our planning. Um, having that in mind, um, that's clear that sudden changes of opinion or flashes of inspiration, they uh, can cause chaos on the ground, meaning 
every time changing the decisions and every f uh, five minutes giving out the decision to our subordinate unit creates chaos. Meaning we have to, if we take decisions, we have to be clear on that. Uh, calculations and assumptions based on a management procedure enable follow-up planning. That's clear because uh, as soon as we um, took our decision and we issued our order, we should have in mind what we're going to do next if we achieved um, our um, goals on the ground or what we, are we going to do if we don't achieve it. So these are more or less the follow-up plannings we have to do. <clears throat> this is the one um, decision-making process we have implemented in Liechtenstein, in Liechtenstein um, on, on, um, on the basis level, let's say it like that, on the level of, uh, of our communities. Um, it is, as you can see, a circular system, as I described it before. Obviously, the questions and evaluation steps you will see here um, are more complex and comprehensive than they seem in the beginning in the graphic. Um, because you have to imagine, when you, when you see now identification, what does that mean? First of all, an incident occurs, uh, when an incident occurs, we have to assess what is the problem. What do I know about the situation itself, about the incident, what happened? Who else is here? I mean, the only one who is affected is some, somebody else affected. So we need a situational picture in the beginning before taking any decision. Also saving ourselves, maybe. Um, when we have the situational picture, it's about thinking, what do I have to do? Did I get a task or I'm the responsible one to solve the, the situation? What is my task to solve the situation? That's good. Um, what has to be done additionally uh, to solve the situation? What could happen when I do nothing? What options do I have? What do circumstances allow me to do and what, what don't they allow me to do? Uh, and these are the points we have to always have in mind. What are my options? How, does, how do circumstances limit me? And um, what happens when I do nothing? Um, and this brings us then to considerations, to conclusions. And then, after these conclusions, it brings us to decisions. What are we going to do here? What are we going to do to fulfill the task? How are we going to do it? And who does what to solve the problem? And that we have to distribute to our subordinate units to take actions to conduct the operation. During the conduct of operation, it's important to do a control, to have um, indicators to see do we reach the desired effect on the ground? Don't we reach it? And if there are things to be changed, we have to do uh, uh, um, another um, evaluation about that. And also, and again, I did the, uh, 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 an identification phase, uh, 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 a new situational picture, an actualization of the situational picture. So we see this actualization, actualization of the situational picture is important in every phase, especially the end, because we have to see how did our decision uh, um, um, work on the ground? Did we reach, reach this that effect or not? And what do we have to do to reach it? So this is the circular system again, as we already described it. Seems logic and seems to make sense, doesn't it? Um, but what you have to know is um, such a system is not coming from nothing. So um, you should always have in mind, if you want to use such systems, you should train them. Um, you should practice it. And that's why uh, preparation and training is a very important point in um, regarding emergency management all in all and, and, and reacting on complex situations. Because we need preparation and training for um, for being prepared, that's clear. For being trained, um, that's also clear. Um, but it's very important to shorten the chaos phase we saw in the beginning in this in the, in the graphic. 
uh, it's very important to know the actors in the theater. Who are the firefighters? Who is the commanding um, uh, commanding person there? Who takes the decisions in such situations? Who, with whom do I have to cooperate and to talk? It enables communication within, uh, within interfaces between institutions and emergency first responders. You always have to have in mind, emergency first responders like firefighters, they think completely differently like you if you are not a firefighter because they have procedures, they learn their lifelong and then bring on the ground when something happens. So they will follow their principles and their procedures. It uh, uh, doesn't matter what you say and what you think the priority is. Um, they have others. So that's important to know. And maybe it's able to bring our um, um, goals and our wishes to uh, the emergency first responders into the system. But for that, we have to know it. So um, preparation and training is necessary to be able to use material and equipment in an effective and efficient manner. Like we, we, we also build up the CPP first response unit uh, in, in Liechtenstein. Um, or element in Liechtenstein, and they have also a bulk of material. We are able to uh, provide uh, much material when it comes to an event. But the thing is, if nobody knows how to work with it, it doesn't make sense and it's useless. So we have to train it. We have to train how an aggregate works. We have to train how uh, a, a, um, a multiple ladder is constructed, um, and so on. So, uh, all in all, I want to end this year with Murphy's Law. I hope you all know that everything that can go wrong will go wrong. So be prepared, train as you fight. That's all I have to say in, uh, when it comes to emergency management and, for the, and, and to the preparation for emergency management. So I hope you, uh, I could give you some, uh, a glimpse look into emergency management, what is important inside. We had a talk about systems. We had a talk about structures in such systems and structures in the emergency management. We had a talk about um, decision-making processes, one of the most important points, in my opinion, and um, in the end about preparation and training. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a nice day.